All right, so this is the, the standard disclaimer. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, features that will be coming up in an upcoming release. Uh, no guarantees that some of these features might make it. All right, so um, vSAN 7. In vSAN 7, uh, we launched uh, three major features. The, the first feature we launched was the, the integrated file services in vSAN. With this, you are able to now deploy both your block-based and file-based workloads on, on vSAN storage. Uh, we did a lot of enhancements to cloud-native storage. Um, so we'll be talking about how we have enhanced that. Uh, lastly, we are adding the storage support for um, VMware Cloud Foundation services, uh, both the vSphere with Kubernetes and VMware Cloud Foundation services. The default storage platform is cloud native storage. So we'll be talking about how we have added support for all of those uh, features. So vSAN file services. vSAN file services is the native file service layer uh, that we have built into vSAN so that now you can manage file services right using the vCenter uh, management suite that you have used to manage your block-based deployments. So with this, we will be offering unified block and file storage on vSAN. We will be supporting both NFS v4.1 as well as v3 protocols uh, with this release. So what we offer our uh, users is that you can create file shares on, on vSAN and you are able to control the policies, the quotas, you can assign labels to these file shares. So we're offering all of that granularity of management at the file share level. The, the, uh, the value here is that all the vSAN features and capabilities that we have offered for block-based workloads, like availability, encryption, uh, dedupe compression, uh, the operations management integration that we do with vSphere, like inter-maintenance mode, the software update, the disk upgrades, all of those are now extended to file services as well, right? So if you have your file shares up and running and if your VMs are using these file shares, if you're putting your host into maintenance mode, upgrading them, all of that will be automatically taken care of by, by vSAN, right? So and clarifying this question, thing, because this is important because you guys are saying unified block and file storage. The block is VMFS specifically dedicated to ESXi not generic uh, block services, correct? Right, so this is basically the block device, the VMDK that we had offered on vSAN that were uh, for VMs. Now we are offering not just VMDKs for your VMs, but also file shares that your VMs can mount, or your containers can use. That's what we are doing here. All right, and um, this particular feature that we're building uh, is going to be suitable or used by both your traditional VM-based workloads. Your VMs can mount these shares, as well as we are offering these for containerized Kubernetes applications, which I'll be discussing uh, in my following slides. So here are a few screenshots as to how a file service is uh, configured. So file service is any is like any other feature that vSAN offers, uh, just like your space efficiency, your uh, encryption, similar to those file services and other feature that we offer, and you can just turn it on using the configuration tab for your vSAN, right? So what you're seeing here is that you have, you're seeing cluster that's already configured. You can go and edit that configuration and provide that those parameters and then uh, get your file service up and running. So next, what you're seeing here is how we create a file share. Right. So uh, once your file service is enabled, you go and create a file share. And at the file share level, you can assign policies, you can assign quotas, um, uh, and you can even assign a few labels uh, if you want for those, uh, for those file shares. Right. And this screen is showing you how we do the health monitoring for these uh, file uh, service feature. So what you're seeing here is that we monitor, we allow you to monitor the health of your infrastructure, uh, the different file servers, um, as well as the individual shares, right? So if you have uh, any of your shares that are unhealthy or non-compliant, you'll be able to see those uh, health status uh, here. So now uh, moving on to cloud native storage. Cloud native storage is the storage platform that we offer for uh, modern Kubernetes applications that are running on vSphere. The, the first iteration of this uh, uh, product feature was released in uh, vSphere 6.7 update three that went out uh, around August of last year. Uh, what we are doing here is enhancing that particular uh, feature 
with adding new support, right? So what I'm going to be discussing today is everything that you get in vSAN 7 for cloud native storage. So cloud native storage is based off of the, the CSI standard, uh, which is the out of tree storage plugin for Kubernetes. So we have our vSphere CSI driver uh, that we released last year. Uh, with this support, uh, today with vSAN 7, you are able to get block-based persistent volumes on vSAN, VMFS, NFS, and vVol. And we will offer file-based read-write many persistent volumes on vSAN storage. The way that we offer these read-write many persistent volumes is by using the file service that we just discussed. So we have integrated uh, CNS, Cloud Native Storage, with file service to offer read-write many persistent volumes on, on vSAN. So we support the dynamic provisioning of Kubernetes persistent volumes on the different vSphere storage backends. And we have integrated the, the storage class, which is the Kubernetes concept, into the storage policies on the vSphere, all right? And CSI is the layer that ties the two constructs uh, between Kubernetes and, and vSphere. So I have in my following so slide, it, I have uh, an explanation. Well, I'm sure we can use NFS, uh, vSAN-based NFS for other things. Is the primary purpose of this for Kubernetes? Sorry, so uh, so basically, if I understood your question right, you can still go and mount your NFS on top of your uh, containers. But here, what we're doing is vSAN file, uh, vSAN storage can be used for read write many persistent volumes uh, for uh, doing those. Yeah, I understand that. I'm saying, I'm questioning, and maybe two or three, three years ago, I really would have wanted to have file services on vSAN. Today, I don't know if I really care about that from a operations perspective and a capability perspective. Is the product direction, the reason why you guys de decided to deploy NFS on vSAN is specifically to have capabilities in your Kubernetes offering? Sure, one of the primary use cases for file services for vSAN is for modern workloads because Kubernetes workloads, when they're deployed, they just want another access mode to share their pods. And by doing this, we'll just offer them read, write once and read, write many. So that is the primary use case, one of the primary use cases. Just All right, so um, question. with this vSAN sure. 7, we will offer um, uh, services like persistent volume encryption uh, and resizing. So the advantage of persistent volume encryption is that irrespective of your data store uh, being encrypted or not, you can go to the level of persistent volume and enable encryption on certain persistent volumes that you uh, care about, right? So the, the big value that we are driving uh, with this uh, cloud native storage control plane is that operational consistency that you get uh, between managing your virtualized traditional workloads and your Kubernetes modern applications uh, on vSphere, right? Again, I have a few screenshots where I talk about how this consistency is offered, uh, but the idea here is that uh, the operations management, uh, the various operations I talked about, the maintenance mode, um, the, the different uh, scale in scale out, all of those are now even going to be taking care of your containerized persistent volumes, as well as monitoring health compliance. Those as well will be extended to your container volumes uh, like we have done for virtualized volumes before. Just a quick jump in. Um, how do we handle data protection for container persistent volumes? assuming that my containers are pretty volatile. Right. So uh, data protection is something that uh, we are not, uh, I mean, this vSAN 7, uh, we are not uh, uh, talking about data protection right now, but the general idea is that uh, any tools that you have used for your uh, virtualized workloads, VMDKs, should be applicable to your uh, persistent <laughs> volumes as well. And we rely upon the uh, vendor ecosystem to offer those services uh, to our customers. Okay, so we're All waiting right. for VM um, to offer basically container identification and be able to back up what is declared as a VMDK to those systems. Right. So basically, since these are uh, so since these persistent volumes are based off of a uh, first class disk, which is basically the VMDK, the same tools that we're using for backing up those VMDKs should be applicable to these uh, FCDs as well. Perfect. Okay, so here um, we'll be discussing about the end-to-end -end dynamic provisioning workflow for uh, a read-write many persistent volume. 
So what you're seeing here is that you're seeing a, a vSphere cluster um, that is managed by vCenter, and you're seeing the CNS uh, component in the vCenter. Uh, so there's a service that's running in the vCenter. And the first step for a, a provisioning operation is your vSphere admin goes and creates an SPBM policy on vCenter uh, with the required uh, availability uh, and other uh, attributes. Then the name of that policy is given to your DevOps admin who goes and creates a storage class using that policy name uh, that your vSphere admin has given him. So let's say there is an application, Cassandra, that wants to use that particular uh, storage class and uh, wants to get a read, write, many persistent volume. It uses that storage class. And when it is asking for a provisioning operation, Kubernetes talks to the vSphere CSI driver, uh, which then talks to our CNS plugin that is running into vCenter to go and provision that particular uh, volume on behalf of that application. So now CNS looks into that particular SPBM policy uh, that's coming in. It uses SPBM to go and create a file share uh, on vSAN with the required attributes uh, in the policy. Once the file share is created, CNS now mounts that particular file share uh, to the worker VM where this particular pod is running. And then eventually uh, the, the application is given a persistent volume mapped to that particular file share uh, and the application now goes and uses that to share data between its different uh, instances or parts. Right? So that is the end-to-end -end workflow for dynamic provisioning. Um, and uh, basically, as you see here, your DevOps admin does not need to understand anything about SPBM uh, and your vSphere admin still deals with SPBM to offer those services to your uh, developers and DevOps. All right. Um, so the, in the next few screens, uh, I'll be talking about the integrated management experience that we offer for your uh, containerized uh, workloads. What you're seeing here is the capacity monitoring screen where we show not only the space used by your traditional VM-based applications, but uh, also the persistent volumes, both the block and the file-based persistent volumes that are provisioned on that particular cluster. Right, so you, you, the vSphere admin is able to get a complete view of both your virtualized as well as your modern application capacity consumption in the cluster. So what you're seeing here is the dashboard that we have introduced for seeing all your persistent volumes across the many different Kubernetes clusters. So you can, you can even see the labels that are attached to these persistent volumes. I uh, will show you block and file-based persistent volumes. The idea here is that we make it easy for the DevOps admins and the vSphere admins to uh, talk the same language, troubleshoot issues, uh, and so on, right? So if there is a problem with any of your persistent volumes, your DevOps admins can give the name of that volume to your vSphere admins, and they're able to troubleshoot and look at the problems here. So here we are showing how we actually uh, delve deeper into the persistent volume uh, as it is laid out on vSphere. So this screen here, if you click on the persistent volume, what we're showing here is that we are showing you the persistent volume ID, the name of that particular persistent volume that shows up in Kubernetes, the name of the persistent volume claim that is all being shown uh, in the screen. Now, if you click on the basics tab, you will see the vSphere information for that particular persistent volume. So what you're seeing here is that this is a file-based persistent volume, and you have a certain volume ID, and you'll see which data store it is deployed on, uh, what is the policy it is using, uh, and its health and compliance status, right? So basically, as you see, you see that end-to-end -end picture of both your Kubernetes as well as your vSphere uh, uh, information in, in the same tab here. Now, uh, going on, if you want to actually see uh, where this particular persistent volume is placed on the storage platform like vSAN, we will even show you the uh, actual breakup of the different components and where the weakness lies. So basically, you can get to the level of the individual disk on your uh, uh, infrastructure to see if there is any problem with that particular component, which disk is causing those problems, uh, and so on. Right. So as you can see, we have offered that end-to-end uh, uh, traceability uh, for your persistent volumes on, on vSphere. 
All right. So the, the last topic I'll be uh, touching upon is the, the storage support we have added for uh, VMware Cloud Foundation services. So my colleague uh, Bo talked about uh, uh, the VMware Cloud Foundation as well as vSphere with Kubernetes. So I would encourage you to go and look at that video to get some context on this. But essentially what we are doing here is that we are integrating the cloud native storage platform that we discussed uh, 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 in the last few slides with vSphere with Kubernetes that we're offering from VMware to offer uh, the default storage platform for everything that we are offering with uh, vSphere with Kubernetes as well as the VCF, the VMware Cloud Foundation services, right? So, um, so what this integration offers is, is offers the, the support for persistent volumes on vSAN and external storage for uh, the Tanzu Kubernetes grid uh, as part of the Tanzu runtime services, as well as the pod service uh, as part of the uh, vSphere with Kubernetes offering. All right. So any Kubernetes clusters that you deploy, uh, either on the supervisor cluster that uh, vSphere with Kubernetes offers, or the Tanzu Kubernetes grid, will be able to have persistent volume support on the different vSphere storage packets. So uh, a thing to note here is that we will be offering block-based persistent volumes on vSAN, VMFS, uh, NFS for this particular uh, offering, uh, for this particular integration. Um, right, so you will not have the file-based persistent volumes for your um, vSphere with Kubernetes. So the other thing that we have done is we okay, have I, offered. I kind of, I kind of passed out for a second there. Can you repeat that? I'll have block-based access via basically Tanzu. Is what is that what I heard? No, you will. Yeah, that's right. So basically, you will have block-based. So we we discussed the read-write many, the file-based persistent volumes that we're offering for vanilla Kubernetes in the previous uh, slides, that support will not be there for uh, vSphere with Kubernetes, uh, with vSAN 7. You will still be able to deploy block-based persistent volumes on the different storage backends, vSAN, VMFS, and NFS, but not the file-based volumes uh, in vSAN 7. So with this, we are offering the workload-centric uh, storage management what that really means is that your vSphere admin, when he creates a namespace, he can assign storage policies, quotas, uh, right in that particular workflow without having to get to another uh, uh, UI screen for configuring storage policies, right? And even monitoring, I have a few screenshots, I'll be showing you that even monitoring can be done right within your workload management uh, uh, UX. You do not need to leave your workload management UX. So all of those things have been integrated right into vSphere uh, with Kubernetes workflows. Lastly, uh, what we're also offering is all these screens that you saw uh, before about listing your persistent volumes, end-to-end -end traceability, troubleshooting, monitoring, all of those have been extended to your uh, 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 vSphere with Kubernetes as well as VMware Cloud Foundation services. Right? So basically, you can um, monitor and troubleshoot those volumes using those dashboards that we showed you. So what you're seeing here is the, um, the so when, you're, when your administrator is creating a namespace, he's able to assign certain storage quotas to that particular namespace so that we uh, respect and honor those quotas for those namespaces. Any workloads coming in, we will honor those quotas for your uh, namespaces. So the next screen that you're seeing here is that when you are creating a namespace, you can go and assign specific policies for that namespace. So if you do not want your uh, developers and DevOps to use a certain policy, you can go and actually control the policies that are attached to that particular namespace. And when you do that, automatically storage classes are created for your DevOps admins as well as developers in the namespace when you assign those policies uh, here uh, to this namespace. Lastly, uh, what this is showing you is that uh, you are able to monitor the different aspects of storage for your namespaces. So you will see what are the different storage policies, how many persistent volume claims, persistent volumes have been attached, the quotas and so on, uh, right in that dashboard that you see for your, uh, for your namespaces. 